Hello and welcome back to the Done Deal YouTube channel. I'm David RC and today we're going to discuss everything you need to know about owning, driving or buying an electric car. There's a little bit of uncertainty about how it all works, battery sizes, cost of charging, environmental impact. And today we're going to set the records clear and try and give you as much information and take any uncertainty out of buying one that we can. Because at Done Deal, we want to make sure that you can buy a car well informed and from trusted dealers all around the country. Now electric cars are becoming more and more common and so that's why we're making this video today, to put a bit of clarity behind it. So let's get straight into it. Buying an EV 101, what do you need to know? What are the advantages? Well, first and foremost, there is a government grant, the SEAI grant, and that is up to 5,000 euros, depending on the car. And that's a grant to say thank you for looking forward into our future and buying an EV. The second relief is the VRT rebate. So basically, there is a relief from the VRT of up to 5,000 euros if you buy an electric car. That's to entice you into it. Now, generally speaking, most manufacturers build this in to their advertised price as it makes more marketing sense. So that is advantage number one. Advantage number two is that at the moment, whilst we're filming this, there is no BIK, benefit in kind, on EVs under 50,000 euros. And if you spend 60,000 euros on it, then you only pay BIK on that additional 10,000. So that's a huge, huge advantage, particularly for companies where some of their employees have company cars. Number three is lower road tax. And number four, well, you get cheaper tolls. Charging, this is a big one with electric cars. And in short, there are three options to charge. Number one is with this. It's called a granny cable. It's effectively a three pin socket. You can plug it into any three pin socket and you will gain three kilowatts per hour. So this is a 44 and a half kilowatt battery. So if you do the maths on that, it's gonna take over 12 hours to charge up. You don't really wanna be doing that which then leaves you with this. This is a type two charger, and effectively this is the type of charger that you'll have installed at a home charger. Now the government actually offers you a grant to get up to 600 euro to get a home charger installed. So the government are really helping you out here when it comes to buying an EV. And this can transfer across seven kilowatts per hour. So it's more than double the granny cable. And that means that you'll charge this car at home in about six, six and a half hours. So it's very, very impressive. Now, there is a faster version again, which is the fast chargers. There's the Ionity stations, there's Tesla stations, and of course there's the ESB. And those, depending on which ones they are, can charge it up to 80% in just 30 minutes. Now, one thing to bear in mind is, when the car has very little charge in it, it will charge very fast. But as you get to 80 or 90%, it will charge a little bit slower. Now let's head to an ESB point and let's talk about the cost of charging. Cost of charging, it's a big one and it's very important and it's probably a very misunderstood one because often people think, is it just cheaper to have a diesel car? So let me explain, much like there's three ways to charge it, there's three ways or three prices it costs to charge. So at home, I pay 26 cents per kilowatt on my ESB electricity bill. Now, the night rate is actually half that, 13 cents. So if I'm paying 13 cents per kilowatt and I multiply that out by a 44 and a half kilowatt battery, it means it's gonna cost me about five euro 70 to charge my car fully. Does that make sense? Then we have the ESB chargers. Now these ones are the public chargers. Anyone can use them. They're located in multiple locations around the country. There's an app to see where the nearest one is. They're fantastic. Now, 
they charge at two different rates, 22 kilowatts and 43 kilowatts. What that means is it will charge 22 kilowatts into your car per hour. So it's a lot faster than your home seven kilowatt. Now you do have a bit of a premium on this. So ESB, for example, they'll charge you about four euro 70 per month. And then you can just pay 23 cents per kilowatt. If you don't pay the monthly fee, you can pay 27 cents a kilowatt. So there's a discount to have that monthly fee. And where it becomes practical is, let's say you're like me and you live in an apartment, you've no way to charge it at home. These become your best friends. And thankfully they're located in Lewis stations and practical places where you can actually leave your car for a few hours to charge up. And then last but not least, there is the Ionity fast chargers or the Tesla fast chargers. And we're gonna focus in on the Ionity as many, many brands are able to use these. Now they charge 73 cents per kilowatt. So it becomes very expensive. If you pull in with a car that's got 30%, you charge it to 80%, which we know is fast, it's gonna cost you over 20 euro, which is, if you think about it, actually more expensive than an economical diesel car. So they're really only if you necessarily need them rather than something you want to rely on day to day. Traditionally speaking, this is where your petrol or diesel engine sits. However, now in the future, the electric motor sits there and the batteries for the most part on EVs sit along the floor, which is nice for handling as it keeps the center of gravity quite low. Now, there are five things in particular that will massively affect the range. And number one on those is the actual temperature. As you can see today, it is a cold and gloomy winter's day, which means that the electric motor is having to work hard to keep the batteries warm, which means it's actually using more and more range. So let's say for example, the MG ZS has a 263 kilometer range, when it actually comes down to it on a cold winter's day, it'll only have about 220 or 230. The second thing is climate control. So if you blast the heating, you're gonna wear down your battery. In fact, a nice top tip is to actually use your heated seats to stay warm as opposed to your climate control. Number three is driving style. And to be fair, that is the same in every car. However, if you've got a heavy right foot, you are going to eat through the range of an EV. So do bear that in mind and try and drive somewhat sensibly. Number four is where you actually drive. So traditionally speaking, motorways are where you can optimize on your fuel efficiency. However, it's the polar opposite with EVs because of the regenerative braking, they actually favor around town driving. So when you see a car getting maximum range, chances are it went nowhere near the motorway. And last but not least, believe it or not, is just leaving the car stagnant, sitting there and off. That actually burns through range. So it's not like a petrol car where you can fill up the night before and then on you go the next day you have a full tank. You'll actually lose 10 or 20 kilometers range by just leaving it sitting there overnight. Now the solution is that 99% of electric cars come with some sort of smartphone app or when you charge them you can set a timer to enable and make sure that it has a full charge ready to go the next morning. The MG ZS doesn't actually have that, but most cars do. To measure efficiency with a petrol or diesel car, you use miles per gallon or liters per 100 kilometers. A lot of people struggle to figure out how you would convert that to electric. But basically up here on my screen, you have kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So to put it in perspective, at the moment, 
Whilst we've been filming this, I've averaged 23.4 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. That means that I'm using 23 kilowatts for every 100 kilometers I drive. Does that make sense? Reliability and servicing costs are two of the biggest stigmas when it comes to electric vehicles, but actually they're nothing to be worried about. First and foremost, most electric cars come with very comprehensive warranties. The MG, for example, comes with seven years or 150,000 kilometers. A Tesla comes with an eight year warranty and those both include the battery. Now, a big one actually that people talk about is will the battery deteriorate over time? Now there's two things that will affect that. The first is if you use fast chargers, that's actually worse for the battery. So generally speaking, if you can charge back at home using a slower charger, that will help prolong your battery's life. And the second one is to not let the battery fall below 10% or to go above 90% unless you really, really need to. So those are two things that will preserve it. Now the other thing to do with it is actually servicing costs are quite cheap. Let's think about it, for example, there's less moving parts in the engine, there's no spark plugs that need to be replaced annually. In fact, you rarely use your brake pads because you're using regenerative braking. So actually running one of these is very, very good. And I read online, and you know online is trustworthy, that actually a Tesla over 240,000 kilometers only lost about 10% of its battery capacity, which is actually really, really good. And let's be honest, who keeps a car for more than seven or eight years? Environmental impact. Now there's two arguments here. One is that they're actually polar bear friendly and the other is that electric cars are detrimental to the environment and they're making it worse. So today we're gonna to discuss what is true and to be honest, they're both kind of true and they're both kind of wrong. So initially to build an EV, they are quite expensive when it comes to the environmental impact. So there is lithium in the battery and for that it has to be mined and to do that, it emits a huge amount of greenhouse gases. So that is one negative. Now, on the positive side, the longer you drive an EV, the less emissions it emits. And obviously then is when you're actually saving the world as such. Now, there is also another thing there, and it's how is the power that you're charging your car with Where's it coming from? So in Ireland, we're very fortunate that 40% of our energy is renewable using windmills, solar. And so we're very fortunate and a huge amount of the power that's been put into this car is coming from those sources. However, in China, for example, 65% of their energy comes from coal. So it's not really saving the world there. So there you have it. It depends where you live how you're fueling your car in terms of electricity. And actually, I do know in some countries, you can pay a premium to only charge your car using renewable sources. That'll probably come to Ireland in the near, near future. That is everything you need to know about buying an electric car. Now, if you do have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to ask us in the comments below. As at Dundeal, we are determined to bring you independent buying advice and to help you along the journey of buying your next car. If you are interested in electric car ownership or any new car for that matter, then feel free to hit the link on the top right hand corner where we have over 1,000 trusted dealers nationwide. For now, thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to subscribe, leave us any feedback, let us know what cars you'd like to see us review in the near future, and thank you so much for watching.